When I came to the university in 1925, Cloyd Heck Marvin was the president. And uh, one of the first ceremonial acts that uh, Cummings and I did on our arrival was to go to his office, and uh, we were warmly welcomed. But that relationship uh, didn't last very long because uh, Cloyd Heck Marvin was, was uh, not, shall I say, one of the preferred men to hold the presidency. So in uh, the following year, he was relieved of his uh, uh, authority and duties here, and Cummings was put in as acting president. Well, in the meantime, I had done a lot of driving for Cummings. He was, uh, he had a Model T Ford, was not himself what I would say a, an expert driver. Uh, so I would usually chauffeured him wherever we went. And when he became president, he asked me to be his driver. And the president's car was a big black Lincoln touring car. Would seat about uh, seven people, I guess. And it was a, a terrible monster on uh, on the use of gasoline. I think we made six miles to the gallon, and any trip we made uh, had to be carefully calculated to, well, how far it was between gas stations. And in those days, the gas stations were few and far between. But I did much driving for him as, <clears throat> when he was acting president. He had to go to Phoenix frequently, and uh, that incidentally brought me in touch with. Uh, uh, people that uh, stood me in good stead later, people like uh, Colonel McClintock, who was state historian, and uh, Dwight B. and uh, Dwight B. Hurd and his wife, and uh, Osborne and George W. P. Hunt, and uh, other dignitaries of that kind. And I would uh, the the only way to Phoenix in those days was via Florence, and as you know that. Uh, there's, a, there's a long straight stretch of road there traversed by many, many gullies. And I used to keep myself awake nights when I drove them back from Phoenix by counting these, these confounded dips because they weren't bridged. They weren't uh, uh, covered over at all. But that's the way I kept myself awake. <laughs> at any rate, uh, in 19... 27, I want to make a little detour here and to show you how we operated archaeologically in those days, uh, far from the uh, <clears throat> refined ways of, uh, of today. The Arizona State Museum needed basket maker material. It was shy on specimens from the basket maker horizon, which would be before about uh, five or 600 A.D., earlier than that. So Cummings, in the summer of 1927, gave me uh, $60. He checked out a Dodge screen truck from the university garage, and he said, I want you to go to northeastern Arizona and find some basket maker materials. Now, that was the research plan. None of these fancy research plans of the t in the projects of today. Go to northeastern Arizona and find some basket maker material. So I started out, uh, I went to Flagstaff where uh, Major Brady from the Museum of Northern Arizona <coughs> joined me. We took the back road up to the Grand Canyon. That was my first glimpse of the Grand Canyon. Then went to Kayanta. And from there I uh, rented a horse and with the cowboy rode into Batotican. And that was my first exposure to that. Then we headed over towards the uh, Lukachukai country. It was there that we found a cave or two, and I did get some basket making material, <clears throat> including several mummies and uh, basketry and pottery. It was uh, at the time when basket makers were making pottery, just the beginning of pottery production in the Southwest. At any rate, after I got home from that uh, expedition, uh, it was time for the Pecos Conference. Now, the Pecos Conference in New Mexico was called by Dr. A.V. Kidder. Uh, prior to that, had extensive experience in northeastern Arizona and southwestern, southeastern Utah, <clears throat> and had written in 1924 what amounted to the first codification, as it were, 
uh, the first overview of Southwestern prehistory is Archaeology of the Southwest. And uh, I consider that publication to be essentially a, the Bible for Southwestern prehistory. So uh, Kitta thought in 1927 it was time to get the archaeologists who were working in the Southwest together to uh, have several days seminar, discussion as it were, and see if we could come to the, uh, if they could come to grips with uh, the major problems. Well, Cummings was invited, and uh, he invited me to go along as his driver. There was room in the car for others, so T.T. Waterman, who was then on the staff, and he was a linguist, he went, as did clearly Tanner, Clearly Fraps in those days. She later became Mrs. Tanner. We all went, and, and my wife, uh, to be, who was visiting her sister here in town, who was the wife of the philosopher who came in 1917, shows you how complicated these things get. Anyway, she was visiting here, and I had my eye on her. So Cummings invited her to come along. Well, that was a heaven-sent opportunity for me. But Clara Lee and I were the only students at that conference. And all the others, there was Sylvanus Morley and Neil Judd and Frank Roberts, Walter Huff, Hewitt, all the big names in Trober. South. Trober was there, Sylvanus Morley was there. All the big names in Southwestern archaeology and a few uh, from other areas of the New World. Well, the trip there uh, was a little bit uh, troublesome because we, we had three flats and changing a tire on one of those big Lincolns isn't the easiest job in the world. Uh, and I had brake trouble and we, it took us two days, two full days to make Santa Fe. A, day, a, a trip you, you can make in a day easily now. At any rate, uh, the trip behind us, we enjoyed that session enormously at the conference and uh, it was uh, very profitable for me because uh, not only for having met these people but uh, for having been privy to the to listening to these people discuss these problems uh, pro and con where do we where do we make certain divisions or breaks in the chronology that they were trying to build and out of that conference came the, uh, what's known as the Pecos Chronology, which uh, identifies basket maker one, was, which is hypothetical, basket maker two and three, all dating, well, we didn't know where they dated in those days <clears throat> because tree rings hadn't come into existence. But then Pueblo one, two, and three, four, and five, five being the historic present. So that a system for uh, the collation of all of this scattered information that had been brought together by Southwestern archaeologists, uh, it was put together in this format, and that uh, was used for many, many years and still is employed with some modifications. But that was the outcome of that conference, and uh, the conference is best known for that. And uh, I may say that the Pecos Conference was the stimulus for other conferences of, uh, s of the same sort uh, to be developed uh, through the United States. So for example, the Midwestern Conference, the Eastern Conference. These are all offshoots, or, or uh, they, they were uh, um, born by, let's say, the concept that was developed at the Pecos Conference. So that was, a, that was an important event. And I'm glad to say that the Pecos Conference is still going on and that the, uh, it was, with, with the exception of a few interruptions during the wars, uh, it's been held almost annually ever since. So it's a time when people can get together to exchange views and uh, uh, I must say that the more recent conferences haven't come up with anything as concrete as the old Pecos chronology, but they were nevertheless uh, forums at which people could exchange views. 
the warm relationship between myself and the Cummings family, I always appreciated. I deeply appreciated the opportunities he made for me. And uh, I found him to be a humanitarian, a humanist. He was interested in the classics, but he was not long on, uh, shall I say, the, the hardcore scientific discipline. In this respect, I found him to be quite different than uh, Kidder, who had called the conference, because Kidder was, uh, uh, while, while being well up on social sciences, uh, was nevertheless uh, a much more disciplined type of individual. And uh, he, he asked more questions and uh, put together the techniques and the methods to study those, uh, the answers to those questions. He was a man of uh, great renown, of course, and uh, great skill. And I respected him for that. He was a very articulate man, very humble, but uh, very precise. And that reminds me that um, of my other contacts, uh, like Dr. Douglas, who was here at the university working on tree rings, and Dr. Colton, the director of the Museum of Northern Arizona at Flagstaff, and Mr. Gladwin, who was the director of Gila Pueblo. Then all of these, Cummings, Kidder, Colton, Gladwin, each one was different, and from each I learned something. And it was that combination that uh, I'm in eternally grateful for, that I was exposed to the, the techniques and the thinking and the behavior of these men. They were all different. And they all had something to say. So uh, I'm the beneficiary of that, uh, of those contacts, and those associations. By working hard, as I said before, uh, I did get my AB degree in 27. And in those days, it was still possible to get a master's degree in one year. And there were three of us who were students working towards our masters in 27-28, uh, and that was Florence Hawley, Ellis, Clara Lee Fraps Tanner, and myself. We uh, succeeded in uh, completing our, the, the requirements for the master's degree. And uh, then Cummings, who was shorthanded, he was holding down the department by himself, turned around and hired the three of us. We travel east, as I say, stopping at Santa Fe on the way to attend the Pecos Conference. And then, uh, uh, by easy stages, got to Harvard, became established in the graduate student residence uh, area named Holden Green. And uh, I became acquainted with my professors. Now, I thought that uh, having earned a master's degree at the University of Arizona would stand me in good stead, but it uh, meant nothing. Uh, Tazer, who was my advisor, said, uh, or who was the head of the department and uh, also my advisor, said, you're going to have to start from scratch, which I did. Uh, I had to take courses, beginning courses on the graduate level, and uh, uh, go through the whole routine again. Well, I had the, an, the, the jump on s most of my colleagues because I had considerable field work experience under my belt. And uh, certain things that were happening in the Harvard curriculum uh, struck me as being a, a little demeaning for a person of my presumed skills. And uh, <clears throat> I think of one in particular, in the basement of Peabody Museum, they had a large sandbox about 20 feet square, two feet high, in which uh, things would be buried. And the students back there would have to excavate these things, learn the technique of excavation, recording, plotting, measuring, and all that sort of thing. And to me, that was... Uh, the thought of that was anathema because I I had had some real experience excavating. So I told Tazra, I said, I don't, don't think I should have to go through that or be exposed to that indign indignity. 
And he agreed with me, so I was excused from that. But an immediate problem faced me. I had, by arrangement with Mr. Gladwin, only two winters off. And in those two winters, I had to not only meet all the academic requirements, but I had to get a thesis in hand, a dissertation. So uh, I discussed the problem with him, and he said uh, uh, he agreed with me. I ma made the, uh, the uh, proposal that I do some work on Egyptian wood. Uh, now, the Egyptian wood comes from Lebanon, cedars of Lebanon. And by my visit to the uh, Boston Museum, Boston, and, uh, uh, it was a Metropolitan Museum of Fine Art, I found that they had a whole basement full of uh, planking, wooden objects from Egypt, and while the rings in that cedar were beautifully preserved, and I could see that they were fluctuating enough in size so that we could develop a chronology. And I thought to myself, well, this, uh, uh, even though the wood didn't grow in Egypt, uh, by developing a long chronology for this, from the cedars of Lebanon, we could at least develop a chronology that might show how long or how short some of the dynasties were. And there were, as you know, a considerable number of those spanning several thousand years. We could at least uh, clarify certain gaps that existed in the Egyptian chronology. Thinking that problem over more, uh, the practical aspects uh, began to emerge and one of the most immediate problems was, was that of financing. I would have to go to Egypt and persuade cranky museum curators of letting me drill holes in their planking and all of that. So. That meant not only looking at the tangible artifactual material that was there, but what was there in the way of notes and uh, photographs and uh, maps. Well, as luck had it, there was a wonderful set of maps made by Fr Frederick Webb Hodge, who was a member of that expedition in those early days. <clears throat> and there was a wonderful catalog card, uh, a set of catalog cards for the artifacts. And there were a few glass plates, deteriorated photographs of the expedition but no notes, and uh, that presented a, a very serious problem. There were no field notes that I could use, so I had to use the maps and what information was on them and the field cards. Uh, I even made a trip to New York and Washington, the National Museum, Brooklyn Museum, High Foundation uh, in New York City, and the Metro, and the Museum of New York Museum of Natural History to try to find the notes. Uh, Hodge at the time was was living and he was director of the Southwest Museum in Cal Los Angeles. I was in correspondence with him trying to trace those notes and uh, he gave me the suggestion of where to look but beyond that uh, uh, no further ideas. But when Hodge died and his an inventory was made of all the documents he had. He had Cushing's notes in his collection, but he had forgotten it. So I didn't have access to that material. And uh, uh, the report was written, the dissertation was written, and uh, it was uh, accepted in time. And uh, uh, but it lacked that uh, the detail that I could have. Uh, given it, the authority I could have given it with uh, uh, that material that Cushing, his, Cushing's observations that he made in the field at the time. Not long after I became involved in the uh, uh, Hemingway material, Dr. Charles Willoughby, who must have been with the Peabody Museum since its founding a long time ago, he was a very old gentleman asked me, called me aside one day, and he said, uh, what do you think of that turquoise frog in the Hemingway collection? And I had looked at this frog. It's uh, 
uh, frog about uh, two, two and a half inches in diameter. Uh, it's a shell encrusted with turquoise, which is customary here in the Southwest, and we have good, wonderful examples of that. And I said, well, I have some misgivings about that because uh, the technology that's expressed in it, the, the way it's made, is different than the uh, genuine articles that I've seen f uh, in the Southwest. And he said, well, you write Fred, Frederick Hodge about that frog. He knows that story. So I wrote uh, f Dr. Hodge, and he wrote back, and this was a longhand letter written in his own script, which have, has a very unique flair. And he told the story about that frog. He said that one day uh, uh, two Phoenix real estate people came to Camp Hemingway. They s showed Cushing a turquoise frog. The letter from Hodge uh, wrote, in, uh, wrote me in, in considerable detail just exactly what happened and uh, what he thinks happened. Uh, he didn't have the whole story, but uh, this is how he put it together. If you look at uh, the genuine articles that come from ruins in the Southwest, and these frogs uh, are always have a background of shell, but the, the bits of turquoise are very neatly squared, and uh, they have slightly beveled edges, so that when the little pieces are fitted together, the fixative, the glue that held, uh, attached the pieces to the shell uh, was squeezed up in that little crack that was made and uh, the pieces were more solidly put together that way. The Zuni Indians that were working for Cushing and his work crew uh, were told, now I should go back and say that Hodge was greatly, or Cushing was tr uh, greatly impressed by this turquoise frog that he saw, and he was bound and determined to find one. But the time wore on, and one day Cushing came out of a closed tent. He had, uh, he had found something to do in the closed tent that uh, kept him off of the ruin excavations, the proper, the, uh, supervising the digging itself, and he was busily engaged in something in this closed tent. One day he came out to Hodge, and he had his fist clenched, and he opened it in front of Hodge, and here was a turquoise frog. Hodge looked at it, didn't say anything, and Cushing said, yes, but it looks too new. Nothing more was said about it. Then, since this expedition was a rather formalized and, and well-heeled expedition, it was being funded by Mrs. Hemingway, of, she was a Bostonian, uh, and the expedition uh, attracted, attracted a good bit of attention. A fellow by the name of Sylvester Baxter, who was to check on uh, what was going on so he could write some stories. And the first evening after dinner had been cleared in the tent in Camp Hemingway, Cushing walked in and he had his fist clenched again and they opened it up, and here was the same frog in front of uh, Sylvester Baxter's face. And Sylvester Baxter said, Great Lord Cushing, where did you get that? Cushing said, found it in a, in a jar uh, over in uh, Ruin 7 or something like that. And uh, Baxter immediately wrote this story up. It made a big splash in the papers all over the United States. It was, it was just, it cr created an enormous amount of interest. Well, when Willoughby asked me about this, uh, I said there were certain things wrong. The little p pieces of turquoise were irregular. They were not the nice squared, the bead had, uh, the, the frog had two eyes for beads and a bead anus, and that I had never seen in the the real examples, the ancient examples here in the Southwest. So I told him of my doubts about it. At any rate, what, what Hodge told me uh, really confirmed my suspicions, that the piece was spurious, that uh, Cushing had made it, 
and that he tried to pass it off as a real specimen. Well, that precipitated a lot of arguments uh, in another area because Cushing had uh, worked in Florida as well, and he came up with some very fancy painted wooden objects in one of the wet sites in uh, southern Florida, key sites in the Keys of Florida. And there were questions about the authenticity of that. But they have since been proven to have been authentic. But because of uh, Cushing's uh, uh, tremendous enthusiasm to find one of these things, and he didn't, and he made it himself to, to substitute for it, uh, the, uh, his veracity and the authenticity of some of the materials he found were uh, sometimes questioned. At any rate, that's a sidelight on the Hemingway collection, which uh, isn't generally known, and uh, it should be reported. There are still those who think this is a genuine specimen. I would uh, have to take the opposite point of view. The first year at Harvard drew to a close. During those years when uh, Dr. Cummings was acting president of the university and uh, I was his official chauffeur, he would ask me to uh, do assignments that did not involve him. In other words, I had to do some chauffeuring for people uh, on the side. And I remember two of these instances primarily because of their, they told me something about uh, the Indian populations of this part of the world. There was a lady in Phoenix who was the uh, president of the Women's Clubs Association of Arizona. And she came to Tucson, but had no transportation to Nogales, where there was an annual meeting of the Women's Associations of Arizona. So Cummings asked me to take her to Nogales. I have forgotten her name, but she was courteous enough to invite me to attend the introductory session of this association meeting. I felt a little... Sh uh, strange about that, being the only male member of the group. But uh, uh, what was important to me was the fact that in her introductory remarks, she described a conflict, a war, between the Maricopa tribe and the Pima tribe in the last part of the last century. And this war took place near Pima Butte, along the Gila River, south of Phoenix, and uh, she made the point that the warfare was conducted only during the daytime by the men. It was mostly hand-to-hand -hand combat, that the weaponry used was, uh, uh, were bows and arrows and wooden clubs. And these wooden clubs were about um, 18 inches to two feet long. They had a very large expanded distal end that was flat and ever so much looked like the old potato mashers, uh, a, a giant version of the potato mashers we used to use. Well, those were used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. At any rate, she described uh, this incident and uh, uh, warfare was being conducted from sunrise to sunset. They were carrying it on in a gentlemanly fashion and uh, Nighttime came, the men would retire to their camp, the ladies would feed them. Indian women were following the uh, war path, as it were. And the, the Pima women decided that this wasn't going very well, that something ought to be done about it. Uh, so they secretly planned among themselves to attack the Maricopa camp at night, surprise them. They did that indeed and routed the Maricopas. And of course, in the process, they made use of uh, these big wooden clubs. So at that point, uh, this lady who was chairman of the Association of Women's Clubs reached under the podium, pulled out one of these clubs, and said, ladies, I give you the first women's club in Arizona. Well, I always re remembered that because it told me something about the Indians, but. Uh, 
also the fact that uh, here in modern times that uh, something happened that could be brought in and uh, provide a, an amusing incident uh, for, the, for those present. The other incident also involved uh, a trip to Nogales. To explain this, I have to say that Camp Stephen D. Little, a military attach, uh, encampment, which was located in the, in the northern outskirts of Nogales, was um, inhabited by black troops. It was all a uh, all black encampment. Troops there had a band, and that band was to play a concert on the university campus. So Cummings asked me to take the university bus in Old Rio, which had a capacity of about 30 people, to drive to Nogales, pick up the band, bring them up to the campus for the concert, which they played, and then I had to return the band to Nogales. Well, that got me into, to, into Nogales quite late in the evening, and they asked me to spend the night there, which I did. Well, this is all incidental to the fact that the, this episode coincided with uh, an uprising of the Yaqui Indians. And the army, Mexican army, was expecting an attack on Nogales by these Yaquis. So the next morning early, with a couple of the officers in camp, I went up on the hill behind uh, the encampment and through binoculars, we saw the uh, Mexican troops digging in, digging machine gun nests, trenches, and preparing for the attack of the Aki Indians. Well, the point of this is that as recently as the late 20s, that we had these, uh, these uh, imbalances between the people, uh, the natives and the Indians that there was still warfare going on in those days. And that made quite an impression on me as a, as a relatively, a relative newcomer to Arizona. So that, uh, uh, those, those are incidental to driving for the president. And I learned something in the process.